Okay, let's start today's mathematical biology seminar. Today we have uh, Professor Mark Lewis. He's a professor at Department of Mathematics and Statistics and Biology at the University of Victoria. Uh, his study is uh, his study is focused on uh, mathematical biology, especially on uh, um, spatial ecology. Today he will give us a talk about target reproduction numbers. So thank you, Mark. Uh, please start. Right. Oh, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to see you, although virtually. <laughs> um, and uh, so what I want to talk about is work with uh, done with Zisheng Shui and Pauline Vandendriesch. And um, it's, uh, mo it's really in the paper that most of it's in the paper that's shown here on the first slide. And uh, Reproduction numbers are commonly used in ecology and epidemiology. Uh, it turns out definitions sometimes vary. Um, uh, with COVID, we've certainly heard a lot about uh, the reproduction number um, recently. Uh, in this talk, I want to introduce the idea of a generalized reproduction number uh, called a target reproduction number. And it focuses on uh, a reproduction number that targets specific population control strategies. And uh, I want to develop some theory for this and show that our classical uh, R0 is a special case of a target reproduction number. And I'll illustrate the theory with an ecological example, which is controlling an invasive weed. And so throughout the talk, I'm going to sort of introduce the biology and then introduce some theory and then kind of go back and forth. Um, and so we'll start with the biology. This is, uh, even though it looks good, it's an invasive weed. It can um, get into agro ecosystems and reduce the yield like into wheat fields. Um, it has a kind of variable life cycle. It could be annual or biennial or even a short lived perennial. It prefers disturbed habitats. You'd see it on the roadside um, and it invades these agro ecosystems. And um, it is a pernicious weed in North America, even though it's native to, to Europe. And if we think of a life cycle for uh, this weed, um, there are uh, three stages, uh, seeds, and that's really a seed bank, that's stage one, rosettes, these are vegetative structures that don't have uh, flowers, and flowering plants, and so those are one, two, and three. And so if we have a structured life cycle shown in the bottom here, uh, if we uh, focus on flowers, flowers uh, uh, produce, uh, flowering plants produce uh, fl flower heads that produce seeds, and these seeds can go into the ground into the seed bank, or they could germinate into rosettes, or they could germinate into new flowering plants. And so uh, those are the three edges coming out of uh, node three. Uh, if you're in the seed bank, you might stay there for a few years, and you might uh, germinate into a rosette or germinate into a flower. Now, if you're a rosette, um, you could uh, mature into a flower the next year and then uh, produce seeds that uh, following year. And so it's a, a kind of a complicated life cycle. It's rather interesting. And we'll use this as our example when we have some theory. And I just want to point out that um, uh, invasive plants or plants in general can have very complicated life cycles. And here are just a few uh, life cycles associated with uh, different, um, uh, these turn out to be in invasive uh, populations. Um, and uh, so sometimes the graph structure is um, complex. We can also uh, think, think about this life cycle graph in terms of a projection model. And uh, throughout, we're going to assume that uh, the matrix, or you can think about it in terms of the matrix or the graph, is um, irreducible. And, uh, and so uh, in this case here, uh, we can take the entries in the life cycle graph and put them into a matrix structure. And th this would then project how the population changes from one year to the next in a discrete time context. Uh, and then uh, if we have a model like that, there, if you're in a biology department, uh, people uh, uh, love to uh, calculate uh, the, the growth rate. Uh, and so um, this is very commonly done in ecological circles. Uh, and if we have a um, irreducible matrix and we know that there is a dominant eigenvalue that's real, and if it uh, is uh, 
greater than the one, the population will eventually increase. And if it's less than one, it'll uh, decrease. And so this is very kind of classical theory. And of course, we would have k uh, such pairs for a k by k matrix. And uh, the lander we're interested in is the largest one of these. And uh, so um, this theory is uh, well established and um, has given rise to a, a little bit of a cottage industry of uh, working out lambda for either for invaders or for populations at risk and trying to see if one can change them, um, make them less than one or larger than one. Uh, one other thing that is uh, fairly common is uh, elasticity analysis or uh, really sensi proportionate sensitivity analysis. We can think about it for modifying controls. We're, uh, we're changing the entries in, in the matrix A, and we want to see how the uh, growth rate changes uh, proportionally with respect to a proportionate change in the entry in the matrix. And in ecological theory or <clears throat> matrix theory, this is called uh, elasticity. And, uh, and then often uh, elasticity theory will point to uh, what should be controlled or which is most sensitive for control. And so a, a very kind of classical way of looking at populations is to determine a life cycle, estimate parameters. So then we'd have the entries in the matrix A, calculate the population growth rate, look at the elasticities, and then um, look for control agents that uh, can affect transitions with high uh, elasticities. And so if we go back to this uh, example, Scentless chamomile, it produces a lot of seeds, like up to a quarter of a million seeds, which is kind of incredible. And this is just a reminder of the, uh, the matrix model. And uh, so uh, actually, this is data from a long time ago, but it's uh, really perfect for illustrating the ideas today. And uh, one of uh, Amy asked me if I did field work. And um, indeed, uh, this is uh, Tomas Di Camino Beck, one of my grad students from a few years ago, uh, growing these scentless chamomile. And this is his field team. And if you look closely, I'm, um, I'm in there too. And uh, so they, uh, these are the patches of the, and he, he uh, basically worked out the entries in the matrix, worked out the landas. And of course there's variability uh, in one year, the lambda was higher because it was a, a good year with lots of moisture. Another year it was lower when it was uh, a drier, but very large lambdas. When you look at the elasticities and they've been rescaled to add to hundred here, uh, it's the flower to flower transition that needs to be uh, focused on here in, in both the good and the bad years. Okay, and so this is what the elasticity looks like. Okay, so how does that help us? Well, it, it's, it's kind of a head start, but um, uh, is this really the best method for assessing control? And I, the way I'm trying to talk about this is I'm using um, uh, th this ecological example, but it turns out the theory I'm going to talk about today has a, uh, an analog in continuous time. And so we can think about this in terms of controlling COVID, say, with a continuous time model or, or other diseases as well. Uh, so one of the issues is there's no simple formula for the eigenvalue for higher order polynomials. And so this is, um, we're reduced to computing the lambda and the elasticity uh, numerically for a particular data set. And if the data change, then we have to redo this. So there's no kind of general insight that would come from this. Uh, and so uh, one, of the, uh, one of the ways people have looked at um, uh, getting around this is to uh, compute are not. Now in ecology, this is often called the net reproductive rate, even though it's a, not really a rate, it's a, it's a ratio. Um, and, uh, and if you're familiar with epidemiological models, there's a very similar process that occurs um, uh, there. And so the idea is we break down our matrix A, the entries in A, to uh, transitions and fecundities. And the fecundities, of course, are these um, things that come from the flowering plants uh, because they're producing new individuals. And so the F matrix shown on the right here just has entries in the third column. And the transitions are changing from one stage to another. And uh, so um, because uh, T is a transition matrix and, and so these uh, entries, these A's uh, are, are going to, uh, the column sums are going to add to um, less than one. The spectral radius of uh, T is, uh, is uh, less than one. And that's what we see at the end of the first line here. And so we can think about uh, now uh, our original model, NT plus one is A and T, or we can think about a, a different model on a generational time scale. 
And uh, so you can say how many, um, in, what's going to happen over an entire generation. So um, uh, Q is a next generation operator. And then we can say, well, an individual could produce offspring in its first year, that's uh, F, or it could survive one year and then produce offspring, that's FT, or it could survive two years and then uh, produce offspring in the third year and so on and so forth. And so we have an infinite sum here, but because the spectral radius of T is less than one, we can write it as shown at the end of the line here. And so Q is our next generation operator. And then we can uh, think about the uh, eigenvalues of Q. And the um, largest eigenvalue of Q uh, is uh, the uh, net reproductive rate or R naught. And the population grows uh, uh, if and only if uh, R naught is bigger than one or and decays if uh, R naught is less than one. And so there is an equivalence to R naught being greater than one and lambda being greater than one. And this theory uh, was developed in discrete time uh, by Cushing and Yi Kang um, uh, in the 90s. And uh, probably in continuous time, the equivalent theory that has been widely applied to epidemiology, there's a, a, a lot of people that have worked on this, um, like uh, Otto Diekmann and so forth. And, uh, uh, but the paper that uh, illustrates this theory the best is a paper by uh, Watmo and van den Driesch. Okay, so let's just do that here to uh, continue with our example. So we've got our uh, transition matrix here, so we can uh, uh, compute I minus T inverse, and it's shown on the left here, and we have our F matrix, and so we can pre-multiply I minus T inverse by F and get the matrix on the right here. And uh, so this is a, a rank deficient matrix, um, and it has, so it has two zero eigenvalues. And uh, the uh, other eigenvalue is equal to the trace of the matrix, okay? so. Um, here's R naught. Okay, so um, this is nice because now we have an explicit uh, representation for R naught that we can try to understand uh, intuitively if we want to. And that's what I do here. So the original graph is shown in the top here. And uh, so we can break these down into three pathways. There's a flowering plant pathway, there's a which would uh, be going from three back to three. There's a rosette pathway that would go from three to two and back to three, that's the blue one. And then there's the stuff that goes through the seed bank. Okay, so there's, a, um, there's always an A13 involved here. Uh, and then uh, there may be any number of uh, times that it stays in the seed bank. And then uh, it could come back to the flowering plant through A31, or it could come back uh, via the rosette path. And so the one minus A11 here can be thought of as uh, an infinite sum, one plus A11 plus A11 squared plus A11 cubed and so on and so forth. It's just a shorthand way of writing that. And so right away, if we write down an R0, um, whether in discrete or continuous time, we get some kind of intuitive insight as to what the parameters are and, um, and how they affect the uh, overall generational growth rate. Uh, and so, um, R0 has become very popular both in epidemiology and in ecology because it provides, it tends to provide an easier method for assessing whether growth occurs. And as with our original method, we need to calculate an eigenvalue, but now it's for the next generation operator. But typically, and not always, this is easily written down explicitly and yields some kind of insight. And so, I would then ask, how do we address the problem of targeted control agents? And so it turns out that the idea of R0 can be generalized to deal with a specific targeted control to give a target reproduction number. And in that context, R0 can be thought of as a uh, specific kind of target reproduction number. And that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of the lecture talking about. Uh, and so let's go back to the biology again and think about how do we actually uh, control scentless chamomile? Well, it turns out when we were working on this project, uh, it was in um, collaboration with Alberta Environment. And uh, we were uh, asked to um, understand the growth dynamics of scentless chamomile so that two possible control agents could be released. One is a seed weevil and that affects fecundity. Okay, so it affects all those entries emanating from node three uh, shown with the red boxes. And the other was a gall midge, 
which affects vegetative growth and it uh, affects the transitions uh, shown with the blue boxes here. Um, and so uh, there's two possible controls or we could use uh, both controls at the same time. And so we could, first of all, focus on the seed weevil and say, how much does the seed weevil need to reproduce, uh, reduce, sorry, <laughs> seed production in order to control the weed? And so uh, let's just um, uh, t t take a look at the formula now with the, only the red boxes in the R, R naught. Um, and so the seed weevil would control the population by reducing the entries in the fecundity matrix. <clears throat> And so let's think about a case where we want to rescale uh, those entries by tau, so divide them through by tau, so as to control population growth. So we might say, what value should tau at least be if we're going to control the population? And so we can take our R0 equation here and uh, set R0 to be 1, because that's the threshold value, and then rescale these entries <clears throat> by tau. And uh, that's what we've done here. And then we uh, want to solve for, um, uh, for tau, okay? And so in this case here, um, uh, each term in the equation is linear in one over tau. And so when we solve this equation, we just get tau is equal to R naught. And so to control the population, we need to have tau greater than or equal to some critical value in tau or target value, which turns out to be R naught. And so we can also uh, think about <clears throat> R0 in a new way now uh, as the amount that we would uh, scale reproduction by to control the population. And uh, so this is a special case of a target reproduction number. <clears throat> I should uh, ask if there's any questions at this point. OK, I'll just keep going. Uh, Let's think about the target reproduction number for the uh, vegetative growth. And uh, this is shown in the, in the blue here. And uh, so what happens if we try to control the population by rescaling growth via the Golmich? Can we come up with the target reproduction number for growth? And the answer is yes, but uh, to, to get there, I wanna develop some general theory uh, on target reproduction numbers. And so the idea now is that we can, uh, uh, we can break down uh, A into uh, another uh, partition that isn't uh, uh, T and F. And the idea here is that uh, we have uh, matrix B and matrix C. <clears throat> C is the target matrix and B is the residual matrix. And we're gonna require that the spectral radius of B is less than one for controllability. And then we're going to rescale the entries of C uh, and see how much we need to rescale them so as to bring uh, the growth rate um, down from above one to below one. So we're going to be now uh, rescaling the entries of C by tau. And so if, if, we, uh, if we said that uh, B was our transition matrix and C was our fecundity matrix, it would be uh, just as we did before. But now we're kind of generalizing this, and we have uh, a different set of, um, of controls in, in the C matrix. And so um, it turns out for A, B, and C non-negative matrices, such that A is B plus C, uh, A needs to be reproducible, and spectral radius of B is less than 1, the target reproduction number is defined in a, in a very similar way to the way R0 is defined, but now just with a different breakdown of, uh, of the matrix A. And of course, if, uh, if C is equal to A, then um, the, uh, uh, tau C is um, equal to lambda. And, if, uh, uh, and then if, um, if B is equal to the uh, transition and C is equal to the fecundity, then tau C is equal to R0. And so um, uh, it turns out that uh, if we uh, create this control matrix, like we have done previously in the example, then um, uh, it, the spectral radius of the uh, control matrix is equal to 1 if and only if tau is equal to tau C. 
So this yields a practical method for calculating tau c. And so there's this sort of theory for target reproduction numbers, which um, in essence uh, mirrors that of um, the uh, basic reproduction number or net reproductive rate. And so uh, the theorem two says that uh, uh, the spectral radius of A is greater than one if and only if tau c is greater than one equal to one if tau c is equal to one and less than one if tau c is less than one. And so the interpretation is a growing population has a target reproduction number greater than one. And so entries of C must be shrunk if the population is to be controlled. And so we're thinking of a weed perhaps. A stationary population has a target reproduction number equal to one. And a shrinking population such as a population at risk has a target reproduction less than one. And so the entries of C must be made larger. So the tau would be uh, less than one in that case. Okay, um, let's uh, let's do that here. Okay, so now we have our uh, our our B and our C. Okay, and uh, uh, we also have our control matrix here um, uh, by rescaling the uh, entries of C by say sigma. Okay, we're using sigma instead of tau now, so we can compare uh, the first and the second application of the target reproduction number. Um, and uh, so then we can find uh, sigma c by um, uh, solving for the spectral radius of the target reproduction number of the target control matrix is equal to one. Or we can go back to the, um, the original theorem uh, right here and uh, calculate it using um, uh, uh, the, the, the tau c uh, shown on the top here. And they give the same answer. So let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. Uh, and we'll use uh, um, the method where we set the spectral radius of the control matrix equal to one. And uh, you'll notice here that uh, uh, sigma no longer, um, one over sigma is not linear in, in, in this equation. And so we'll get a quadratic. And um, this is a quadratic in one over sigma. And we know that there's uh, just one positive real root to this equation by, it turns out, by our, our theorem one. And that sigma is greater than one, providing the spectral radius of A is greater than one by theorem two. And the alternate method would be as, as given here. Um, and at the end of the day, we get the same characteristic polynomial as we have on this, uh, in the middle of the slide here. Okay, so if we're just thinking about what we did here, the steps to determine a target reproduction number would be to break down a population projection matrix into a non-negative target matrix and a non-negative residual matrix. And we want our target matrix to be non-trivial. And we want to ensure that the residual matrix has a spectral radius of less than one so as to be able to control the system. And then we uh, create a, a control matrix. Oops, I keep on jumping back there. Let's see. There we go, okay. Uh, and uh, this system can be controlled as long as the spectral radius of B is uh, greater than one. And uh, that's pretty straightforward to see just by looking at it because as tau goes to infinity, the control matrix goes to B. And if the spectral radius of B is less than one, then we will have achieved control. But we set the spectral radius of the control matrix equal to one to get the polynomial in, in tau. And uh, we solve for the target reproduction number. And this determines the level of control needed to stabilize the population. And if the original population was growing, then tau c would be bigger than one. And if the original population was shrinking, then tau c would be uh, less than one. And again, as maybe mentioned before, if B is the transition matrix and C is the fecundity matrix, then the above method determines the net reproductive rate or the basic reproduction number. Um, and so if you have an expression for R naught, then these uh, steps two and three can just be replaced by setting R naught to be one in the expression and rescaling the elements of C by uh, tau. And that's, um, that's basically what we did when we, um, when we uh, for example, in, in this slide here, we just took the expression for R naught, set it to be one, and then rescaled by the, um, 
by the um, uh, the uh, rescaled the entries in the control matrix. So that's a, a kind of a quick way of doing it. Um, let's think about the target reproduction number with con two controls now. So this would be if we were to release both of those biocontrol agents, we'd be uh, rescaling fecundity in the right-hand column, and we'd be rescaling the vegetative part in the uh, lower left. And uh, so if we're going to analyze this, we need to have uh, some additional constraint to determine uh, what the best control is. And uh, so here, we're assuming that the cost of control is uh, given by capital D. And it depends on um, tau and sigma. And uh, it's d1 times tau minus 1 plus d2 times sigma minus 1. Uh, and so uh, no control would be tau is equal to 1, sigma is equal to 1. And so we could ask to look at the least cost solution. And so if we set the spectral radius of the control matrix equal to 1 now, uh, then we uh, have uh, this polynomial in tau and in, in sigma here. And so we could uh, write this uh, uh, as, a, uh, as given down here. And so the parameters for the control of the fecundity and the growth are given by a curve in, in tau sigma space that we can plot out. Um, and so just as a little recap here, our, our curve is shown on the bottom here, and uh, our cost is shown above it. The original life cycle graph is shown here, and the entries that are being rescaled by sigma are shown in blue, and those that are being rescaled by tau are shown in red. And uh, so this is the uh, curve. The black line here is the curve that we have in uh, tau sigma space. And so if we're above this curve, uh, in the top right area, we have uh, control. And if we're below this curve, uh, we don't have control. And uh, so now we can uh, draw out lines that describe uh, equal cost uh, curves. Uh, so if we set uh, D to be uh, a constant, then we'll uh, have a, a line of the form shown here. And so if D is less than D critical, uh, we have the first line. And when D is equal to some D critical, uh, we had get a, a point of tangency here. And then if D is greater than D critical, uh, we, we're up in the, the region there. And so the least cost solution would be when uh, D is equal to the, the, the critical value that gives a point of tangency. And then it would give a, a, a value for the uh, fecundity control and for the growth control. Okay. So, um, so this idea of a target reproduction number can be um, kind of sort of generalized to, um, uh, to, to multiple controls. I'm going to uh, kind of show a, a graphical method for computing um, uh, the target reproduction number. And uh, this is a uh, going to focus on where we're controlling fecundity to get R0, but it's a, a general method. And it's, it's kind of a, a cool method. I just want to throw it in here. Um, and so the idea is that uh, we want to create a graph of the controlled matrix where the, um, those things that are being controlled, in this case, the entries of F are res rescaled by the um, R0 by multiplying through by R0 to the minus 1. And then the idea is that we can uh, manipulate the graph using what's called Mason's graph reduction rules. Uh, and when we do that, we then set the weight for the final node on the graph to one, and then we solve for R0. And so the graph, Mason's rule allows us to simplify the graph. And Mason's rules are really, uh, they, they are very similar to those for uh, conductance and electrical circuits. And so here we have, um, uh, uh, it, it, things in in um, in series. Okay, so we're going to multiply a and b. Uh, so we can remove node two and uh, just go from straight from one to three with weight a b on the on the edge. Uh, the second from the bottom is um, uh, in um, in parallel. And so when we re uh, remove one of these edges and replace it by 
a, a single edge uh, that has the weight A plus B. And uh, the, the top rule uh, says if you have a self loop here, um, you can then um, rescale A uh, by um, one minus um, B. So we uh, divide A through by one minus B and then get rid of the self loop here. And so uh, let's just do that for uh, the Santos chamomile case. And so here we're uh, breaking it down into T and F. And so F is our, our um, what we're trying to control. And so we multiply F by uh, R naught to the minus one. And so these entries uh, shown in red here uh, are the first step. And then uh, uh, we want to uh, try to apply these rules. The rules are shown on the right here. And then what we do to the graph is shown on the left. And so the first thing is we have a self loop on uh, node one. And so we uh, would uh, want to replace uh, that by uh, changing the weight on the arrow that's shown in red. And that would be using the first rule. Okay, that'll simplify things a bit. And then we want to actually remove a node. And so we can apply uh, these rules sort of simultaneously. And so, uh, we need to think of all the things that uh, go through um, node two. And so we have, um, we have a loop that, uh, we have something that goes from one to two to three, okay? So if we remove, uh, so it'd be a A21 times A32, that would be using uh, the third rule. And we take A21 times A32 and we add it to this edge on the top here. And uh, the other thing is we have a self loop that would go from three to two to three with the weight A23 R naught to the minus one A32. And so we need to add that to the self loop from three to three. And so by using uh, these rules on the right, then we reduce it to two nodes. Uh, and then uh, we have a, a loop that goes from three to one back to three. So we can multiply these weights together Okay, and uh, and then we have uh, what's shown on on the right here, and we've removed node one, and so now we've got a graph going from flowers to flowers, and we have uh, we can use uh, rule two here. We have uh, two um, um, arrows in in parallel, and so we would add their weights, and <clears throat> and so this is uh, what we do, and then we solve for R naught, and we get the the R naught we had before. Okay, so this is a, a kind of a cool little thing you can do on the back of an envelope when calculating R naught, and uh, uh, makes it a little bit easier. So let's go back to the Santos chamomile. What happened there? Well, first of all, the R naughts were incredibly high, and uh, so uh, now they're broken down in, into the different components of the different pathways, and um, uh, so. Um, so th this is a very difficult seed uh, weed to control, and it's because they produce so many seeds, really. And uh, notice even the flowering plant to flowering plant pathway uh, has a value. The A33 is is bigger than one. And so if we removed all the uh, all the seed bank and the rosettes, uh, we would still have a population that would persist. Uh, so, uh, but if we if we look at um, how the controls would act, uh, we've got the seed weevil, uh, which is shown in the red here, and the gallmage, which is shown uh, with the blue. And uh, Tomas uh, also uh, did some mechanical control to simulate control agents and validate the model. And so it turns out that it's not possible to control scentless chamomile by reducing growth alone. Um, it's theoretically possible to control it via um, reducing fecundity or mixed strategy, but the biocontrol agents weren't sufficiently effective to control completely because of this very high fecundity. Um, and it, it, at the time we were doing this work, it actually turned out that the uh, Alberta government released both of these control agents. Um, and I think that was just before we kind of published the results. Um, so it, they do have an effect, but they're they're not capable of um, fully controlling the scentless chamomile. So in conclusion, um, you know, R naught can be 
considered as a specific kind of target reproduction number where fecundity is being controlled. And more generally, target reproduction numbers can be tailored to the control measure at hand and have the same general properties as R0. Um, and this can give direct insight into the impact of the control measures in the population, particularly when there's multiple controls being applied. And um, so what I don't, what I didn't talk about today, but I, I think I, I should probably talk about in a, in a future lecture or um, is uh, the same kind of analysis applied to uh, continuous time models, such as those you'd find for epidemics. And so that um, analysis is in the paper with uh, Pauline and Zisheng. Um, and so the idea is even if we're thinking about controlling COVID, we can think about uh, different measures like say quarantining, we could have a target reproduction number for quarantining, we have a target reproduction number for uh, masks, um, target reproduction number for immunization and, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, some of these will uh, be easier than others to, to, to use to, to generate insight, but I think they'll all be useful. Uh, so once you have a formula for uh, R0, it's very straightforward to move to a formula for the target reproduction number by modifying the formula. Um, and initially in the, in the history of thought about R0, there have been these debates about what the appropriate R0 is for a particular population. And um, uh, so what this work uh, to some extent says is that uh, from a, a, a quantitative or mathematical perspective, um, as long as you have a legitimate breakdown into a target and control matrix, um, anything will work, okay? But of course you wanna get the biology right. And, uh, but the, uh, so it's not the mathematical uh, underpinnings that um, are, are better or worse for different breakdowns. It's the kind of insight that you generate from, from that breakdown. And so this makes it kind of an interesting uh, uh, kind of problem. Um, it turns out that rather than using an algebraic or graph reduction method of the sort that I showed just a few slides ago, it's possible to write down an explicit formula for uh, the target reproduction number, but it's a little bit involved. Um, and target reproduction numbers have also been applied in epidemiology, as I've been mentioning. Um, and they're a little bit related to other reproduction numbers um, uh, suggested by Heisterbeek and Roberts um, called type reproduction numbers. And as with many things, um, the uh, target reproduction numbers can be expanded to infinite dimensional dynamical systems such as reaction diffusion models. And so um, there's uh, lots of exciting things to do. So uh, with that, I'll just say uh, thanks and open up for questions. I, ha I had a question. Thanks, Mark. That was really an interesting presentation. Um, oh, sure. So you, you discussed kind of in the case where you have multiple controls, this sort of minimal cost um, solution. Is there also a way to use this to figure out sort of if you could control all of the parameters in the system, which one would would allow you to uh, to most effectively control the population? Um, Is there it could yeah. I mean, kind of if you if you could look over all possible breakdowns of this control and um, the, the control matrix, I guess. Yeah, um, it turns out that uh, sometimes you can you can control uh, you can. Oops, uh, <laughs> I was trying to uh, get back to my slide. Um, I'll try to do that now, um, and maybe I'll reshare here. Uh, there we go. Hopefully. That is visible. Um, yeah, we, we see it. yeah, yeah. So it turns out that actually, for uh, uh, it's it's possible to show that sometimes control measures won't work, which I think is maybe at least pertinent to your question. Um, and so, uh, 
uh, when we uh, when we look at uh, uh, this target reproduction, uh, this um, expression here, um, the, it turns out that the blue control measures will never work by themselves. And, um, and the reason is because A33 is bigger than one. And so there's no, as, as we can get rid of every other term in, in that R0 equation, but, you know, um, and it's um, possible to show that, um, uh, that of course, if, if we reduce, um, if we use a control measure shown in red, we can, we can bring R0 to be less than one. And, um, and so the, uh, the, the idea that the uh, A33 is, um, is, is, is bigger than one, um, what it means is that when we've, um, when we've broken things down into the, the B and the C here, one of the requirements is the spectral radius of B is less than one, okay? So what we did for the vegetative control was, um, this was our B here, okay? But it turns out that uh, A33 is, uh, is very large, okay? So it turns out the spectral radius of B is, uh, is not less than one. And so we're, we're kind of violating <clears throat> the, for the parameters appropriate for scentless chamomile, we're, we're violating the assumption for the, uh, for the controllability. Um, Got it. So, so yeah. the idea is to basically restrict to combinations of control parameters where rho of B is less than one so that it's even That's right. the kind of controllable space. Yeah, exactly. And so given that it's less than one, you know that it's, um, it's controllable. Um, and then if you have multiple controls used simultaneously, then um, you should get a curve. Uh, um, one thing we haven't proved, which I think is sort of would be interesting to prove is uh, when we when we applied the the control measure um, with multiple controls, um, uh, this uh, curve in um, uh, tau sigma space that describes when you go from uh, no no control in the bottom left to control in the top right has uh, the appropriate um, convex shape that if you are um, uh, doing a, a, a cost curve that's a straight line, you'll get a, a nice intersection. And so um, uh, one thing that remains to be done is to uh, kind of investigate the shapes of the curves that you would get in general when you have multiple controls and then think about the kinds of additional constraints that then could be satisfied in terms of costs and so forth. Um, this is just an example of, of an application that it works out nicely. Um, but I don't think there's any general theory saying that it'll always work out in such a nice way. And in general, are there, are there problems that come up when you're talking about uh, systems with more variables once you get to, you know, not three or four, but 10 or a hundred? Um, well, yeah. So in um, in in some of these uh, uh, complicated plant models, and also in some epidemiological models, uh, when there are many uh, possible pathways for reproduction, for example, you can get uh, R naughts that are R naught equations that are no longer linear equations in R naught, but are polynomials in R naught. They could be quadratics or cubics. Um, and then it becomes more difficult to easily write down the, um, the uh, target reproduction number. Um, but it, it has occurred to me, and I think this would be quite interesting. In those cases, um, when you write down R0, you're really targeting fecundity, as we talked about, or birth of new infectives or whatever it is. Um, is there another uh, control measure that you could uh, use in your target reproduction number to switch from a <clears throat> quadratic or cubic to a, a linear equation? So <clears throat> this may have a, some practical use. Um, uh, you know, an epidemiological model maybe by, um, in some cases by targeting the rate of quarantine, quarantining, you might go from something that's rather than 
the rate of production of new individuals, you might go from something that's a, a, poly, a higher order polynomial to, to a lower po order polynomial, just a hunch. And so <clears throat> with the full theory of target reproduction numbers, one when faced with a problem might just choose the appropriate control uh, measure to give the, the best insight in the simplest algebra. And then I think that the gist of the talk is when you do that, everything's okay, right? All the, all the theorems and results that we rely on all the time for R0 are still going to apply, providing we may meet some basic criteria. Um, I got a very basic question. Sure. I'm a biologist, not a mathematician sure. by training. So for this model, plants are not, plants don't move around, right? Well, they, they only move through seed dispersal. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So what if you assume agent that moves more actively? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, the models, the way they're formulated right now, <clears throat> don't have um, nonlinear density terms in them. And so, for example, at the at the very start, the um, the uh, the model is just a, a linear matrix model. Um, and uh, so, the the effect of uh, d dispersal is to sort of redistribute individuals in space, and um, so if you, if you, sorry, I'm just going back to this, like uh, original model rate, uh, look right here. So the, the, the say, say this model here, there's not uh, any, uh, any uh, squared or cube terms or nonlinear functions of N on the right-hand side of this equation, although there could be. And so um, if, if you, uh, if, if you don't, include nonlinearities, then the effect of dispersal is just to move individuals around, but not change the dynamics. Uh, and so it's quite legitimate to have uh, uh, a model that would describe a large region and you don't care where they are in that region. In, in actual fact though, I, I mean, nonlinear dynamics do play an important role. Um, and so if you did have a, 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 a like a, a growth term on the right-hand side of this equation, uh, then um, uh, dispersal would, you know, move individuals from high density to low density areas, and it would change the dynamics and so forth. Uh, so in that situation, um, what one can do is linearize around the zero equilibrium, and then this model would only be applicable at the very beginning of an invasion, uh, say by scentless chamomile, and in under under that circumstance, it's before these density dependent effects uh, come into play. And so, uh, so again, the dispersal isn't gonna change the outcome as much. I hope that was uh, helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Do we have any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Mark again. My, my pleasure. Thank you so much for your talk. And thank you, Mark. Thank you. you. Okay. Take care. Okay. The rest of us will see you next week. Thank you okay. so much again. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Bye.